interview, we have with us Professor Bolteseva. Professor Bolteseva specializes in nanophotonics, plasmonics, optical materials, and metamaterials and fabrication. The central theme of Professor Bolteseva's research is to find new ways for realization of nanophotonic devices from material growth to advanced designs and demonstrations. So, without further ado, allow me to introduce Professor Bolteseva and our NSAC president, Yuhang Fong. Hello, everyone. It's such a fortunate thing to invite our dear Professor Bolteseva to our interview. You know, Professor, like we have chance to meet each other in the meetings, but I never got a chance to talk to you in person. So I'm very excited about this opportunity. <laughs> Me too, me too. There is never a time just to chat in the corridors, especially right now, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a special time. Yeah, so I, I did some homework to, to make myself prepared about you. So I Hi. think in one interview, you mentioned that when you were a little girl, you used to spend time at your dad's radio communication laboratory and play with colorful resistors. Yeah, that, that's your childhood. It sounds really different from like normal kids. <laughs> Oh, I can assure you, I was absolutely normal child with all the game and, and childhood things around me. I mean, I had plenty of stuff. I loved dolls. I loved, uh, you know, build, you know, doll houses. And I was almost the only girl in my small town who had Barbie girls to play with. But both my parents were actually engineers. So my mom has a master's degree in applied mathematics, and my dad is an engineer with uh, uh, railroad communication systems. So every time I got sick or we had a um, some uh, no school day, I had a chance to go to my parents' work. And this just happened so that there were engineers, so I happened to like playing with what I would find there. So I remember um, seeing the very first computers at my mom's work, and I remember all the myriads of um, colorful thingies at my dad's place, and these colorful resistors and uh, lamps and oscilloscopes. Um, they were really intriguing to me. But I mean, at that point, I never thought I would work on that. It was like, it was not like, OK, I want to figure out how that works. Uh, no, I was just, you know, genuinely fascinated. And I was just playing with those things as any normal child would play. <laughs> so but actually, my dad insists that um, I, I had a science of an engineer from early on because once I don't remember that, but he said that once he came back um, from work and I and I would tell him, Dad, um, I fixed our electrical boiler. It, it was not working. <laughs> oh, so do you have any friends that like you that want to play science back then? Well, maybe not from the, my childhood, um, but um, I have um, my best friend and uh, she graduated from the same school and same department. And oh. we got to know each other uh, on the very first day at Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology when we were both freshmen and we shared a dormitory room. Um, and uh, she is an absolute star in astrophysics now. She is a professor of astrophysics at uh, in Baltimore at John Hopkins University. Um, oh, and she's um, um, she's very successful. She is also a mom and uh, we share many things and many aspects uh, of our life. So it's very important to um, to have um, a variety of people in your life. Like mm -hmm. I have um, one of my best uh, uh, friends from the school years. Uh, she's in linguist. She's a translator. She is uh, actually training people um, in uh, passing English tests. And so she is totally um, in, a, in a different field. But I also have my friend, uh, professor friend uh, from Jim Hopkins, uh, where we have uh, so many things to discuss, you know, and uh, of course you, you always need someone to complain about and to share things and <laughs> uh, yeah. to gossip about things in academia and outside. So it's it's very nice. Yeah, you mentioned that you you have not think about like playing with science throughout your life when you were a kid. Like have your parents have some like scientists plan for you? 
Oh, well, no, not at all. Um, I think, in fact, I think my mom wanted me to be a medical doctor. Um, my my grandma was a certified nurse, so we had a lot of like medical stuff and uh, right things to do uh, on the health side in my family. Um, but uh, see, and, and as I said, um, both my mom and my dad are engineers. Uh, but what when I grew up, I uh, I think uh, I wanted to be a biologist oh. because I love nature. I love. Uh, being in nature um, and um, that's just something that excited me and um, I always thought that I would be a biologist uh -huh. and my dad, my dad whom I spent a lot of time with in my childhood talking about future and science and big bands and universe and everything, um, he would always say you will be doing scientific research on animals and plants and I will take care of those animals. I will end your forest. So he, as he said, I would be a forester <laughs> in the in the, in the natural reserve where you will be doing your scientific work. <laughs> Interesting. So so even though your parents think differently about the field you're gonna work on, but they're very supportive for you to enter into any like engineering thing. Yeah, well, that's absolutely. Uh, and uh, moreover, I would say that. Um, Soviet system was actually very good um, in terms of STEM education. Um, the great thing that Soviet education system could have been very proud of is that being an engineer, being a physicist was very prestigious. Oh. You know, we had movies and, and, and books and famous actors in the role of a famous physicist, you know, who, and, um, um, and, and there was, it was very motivating for young people to go in STEM. Mm -hmm. And it was also very um, motivating for everyone to get higher education. So going into college, was not something people even thought about. It was like a must do thing. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone knew that doors would open when you get your master degree. Yeah. And that was not a question for me. That was not a question for my sister. My sister, uh, she got a master in uh, chemistry and actually PhD in philosophy of science, but that's a different story. But, um, you know, in, in our family, that was not a question for us whether we will go to college or not. The question was only, OK, do you want to be at a physics department or chemistry department? Or, yes. <laughs> so that was something they would consider. But I and so I grew up with understanding that's what I that's what I will do. You know, I never doubted, OK, maybe I should, you know, go out of high school and open a flower shop. No, I was sure that I will have to study further. So, so it was easy in a way. I only had to decide what exactly I want to do. And uh, in terms of topics or what kind of um, uh, department you will be at, it was uh, totally my choice, um, so that was uh, that was sort of uh, nice. And I would say in Soviet Union we had a very high percentage of people with a college uh, degree, including uh, females. Actually, that was a very good uh, sign of a great education system. Yeah, that's nice. So you said you said that you never thinking about doing anything other than engineering. If we ask, if I ask you now. If you totally forbidden about doing anything related to engineering, science, what would you like to do? Um, if I wouldn't do engineering, I would probably, I would still be somehow related to, you know, science and engineering, but in a maybe more indirect way. Like I feel that a very cool job is uh, consulting. Oh. And cons Nice. Not only like consulting um, is a common way to think about like some of the financial uh, activities, right? Uh, but uh, consulting on a larger scale is connected to uh, being very visionary and mm -hmm. knowing where things are going. Um, so as I see now, for me, it's very important to see the horizon, um, not just focus on one specific thing, 
um, but to uh, to see what what future is going to bring and shape this future. Um, so that's why I think consulting or we can call it scientific or uh, technological consulting um, seems to be very cool to me too. Uh, mm -hmm. In addition to just you know being engineer or being a professor, because that's something that uh, is um, very visionary, uh, very strategic, but it also requires a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, how the technology is developing, how fundamental science is developing, and where things are going. What is the transformative thing that is going to change our daily lives? Mm -hmm. And um, that's a perspective that I love to have in my life. And that's actually why I came back to academia. I have been in some startups and I really enjoyed working in, in the very dynamic teams. But uh, being focused on one thing is great. But I would I love having a perspective and I love to define things that are not now in here, but things that will come. Mm. It's like a predictive thing. Always some yeah, something. Or vision. We call we also call it vision, right? So where to predict where things are going and what to expect and what is going to impact our lives in a most uh, significant way. So you just talk about consulting. I think that's also one thing people are considering doing after their PhD. So actually in, in nowadays, so when people get a PhD, sometimes they're kind of concerned about whether they can get a high salary afterwards. So I think nowadays CS, um, machine learning related, consulting, stocks, accounting, mm -hmm. those are things kind of like distract from the research field. So back in your days, have you got distracted by those things? Not really. I was through uh, such a turbulent time with uh, in a Russian uh, history and especially in the history of uh, Soviet and then Russian science when everything collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, that was really not a question to me to consider whether this will be something that would provide a great basis, you know, financially for my life or not. Um, so that was definitely not in the picture. But what I wanted to say in connection to that, I firmly believe that good um, education, like being an engineer, being a physicist, um, really gives you the right mindset. And frankly, you can do whatever you want afterwards. Oh, Even if you trained as a cell biologist and then got a PhD in um, some other things related to biotechnology, if you want to do something completely different, you will be able to do that because I think getting through college degree and successfully going through a PhD especially just gives you the right preparation and right ability to achieve more, to learn more, to go into new areas. Um, and that's the most interesting part of also being a professor, right? You can define your own new directions. You can always learn. So yeah. I, 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 I always learn from my students because students and postdocs come with different backgrounds than mine. So I learn from them. We define directions together. We learn together. We develop together. Um, and um, again, it just gives you the mindset. You don't have to be uh, trained specifically in one thing and stay working in this area for the rest of your life. And in fact, even in science, it's not considered to be very cool to just do one thing for your entire career. Mm -hmm. Well, you can be extremely successful and there are uh, remarkable scientists doing pretty much all the same. I'm just not one of them. No, 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 you are very nice. Yeah, so you just mentioned about the startup thing. So like when I was reading your uh, resume, I find that actually after your college life back in Moscow, you went to Denmark to do your PhD. And so how does this whole thing like affect you back then? Why do you make such decisions? Right. Um, 
first of all, as I said, um, I was uh, writing my diploma or getting my master's degree back in Russia in most turbulent times for Russian science. Um, I was uh, doing my diploma at Physical Institute um, of uh, uh, Lebedev Institute in Moscow. And in fact, I was working in the department led by Nobel Prize winner uh, Basov, who got Nobel Prize for lasers. But it was almost empty and very dusty because uh, there was absolutely no um, financing going into technology and science in Russia uh, back then. And a lot of scientists simply left for Western countries. So there was almost no research activities left and a lot of uh, people that I st graduated with, they went to um, mass media business, they opened fitness clubs, they went to banks and all sorts of activities. Actually, this confirms my point that you don't have to be trained um, as a, you know, economist to go to the bank business. You can be very successful with your master or PhD in, in applied physics or math. Um, so when I was working on my diploma, I was interacting <clears throat> through um, some of the uh, researchers um, who were guest researchers um, in Denmark, and they just uh, at some point um, showed me advertising for a PhD position under a very interesting European project on photonic crystals where um, I applied because frankly, I, I didn't see much happening on a uh, scientifically at Lebedev Institute uh, back then. As I said, financial situation were so bad that they were not hiring. Uh, there were no um, funding for doing research. So I decided to go and that's how my um, Danish adventure um, started. In Denmark, um, I, I, I truly enjoyed my years doing my PhD project and that's when I had a uh, privilege to work with many amazing scientists. Um, I'm still adapted and, and in fact, I'm still uh, very uh, close to my um, PhD advisor, who is still professor in Denmark, Professor Bozhevolny. Um, and I also got a chance to work in his startup company while being a PhD student. And that was terrific. Uh, we had such a wonderful time. It was such a dynamic team of, uh, of uh, people working all together toward one single idea. And that was wonderful. That was so dynamic, uh, so exciting every day. Um, and um, I still remember those times. That was perfect because I also got some exposure and experience working in startup company together with just yeah. being, you know, at um, you know academia and getting my PhD. Oh, so you do the two things in parallel. That's super cool. So you can see how things go in theory and also in real life. Yes, yes. I mean, in fact, my project was just somehow very naturally part of the startup um, activities. Um, oh. So. I was just lucky that um, my advisor suggested this topic to work on and that I was able to join the team. So that was um, that was actually um, that was great. Uh -huh. So how did you decide like you said your professor kind of proposed a topic, but you decide the supervisor like I, I feel like so the supervisor during PhD and also the topic is very important for people's future academic life. So how do you make the decisions back then? Um, well, first of all, again, I was lucky to have remarkable people around me. So I had an um, opportunity to work uh, with, uh, with many people back in Technical University of Denmark. Um, what I appreciate now is that I, I was given some freedom to decide what I want. So when I came to Denmark, I, I had no idea about what I want to do, right? So I was hired on a very specific project to do a very specific thing. Um, that specific direction was actually not very successful. That was a big European project and one of them was on um, one specific type of photonic crystals, but they were very lossy and so on and so forth. So um, 
my advisor, um, local advisor at Technical University of Denmark, um, he said, well, Sasha, why don't you start working on nanotechnology and nanofabrication? And there was like a turning point for me. Wow. So the turning point for me was actually to go in nano. Wow. And I tried, I was trained on electron beam uh, microscope. I was uh, trained on doing electron beam lithography on an old Wraith machine back at Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, and I loved it. I, I was just so captivated by the ability to do things on a nanoscale um, that um, I continued. So when I was um, producing all very successfully all this nanostructure, that, that's that's how I sort of came in contact with um, uh, Sergei, Professor Sergei Barshevolny, who was um, doing plasmonics and nano optics at that point. Um, and at first, I just started to um, collaborate and do structures for them. And then later, it just evolved in such a way that we started to work closer and closer together. And he advising me eventually. Um, but if I think about it now, um, as I said, I think the turning point for me was just to try going nano and I um, I enjoyed it and it turned out to be successful and it, and it defined my um, original or initial career. And that's yeah. why how, and that's why I came to Burke, right? So that's why um, I, I was very much interested. Um, in um, nanofabrication, nanotechnology. Uh, back in Denmark, I worked in one of the oldest uh, clean rooms in Scandinavia. It's from 1993. At that point, there was no nano like worldwide, right? There was uh, microelectronic centers. And uh, um, so that was uh, pretty much um, um, the hottest thing back then. Mm -hmm. um, and being part of this, um, rapidly developing nano field um, was great and uh, but again that was something that uh, was suggested um, mm -hmm. by my advisor so it's extremely important yeah yeah so nice so like back then when did you decide that you want to go academic life like i like to pursue a professional job yeah it is a, it is a good question um even during my PhD, if you would ask me, um, I still didn't know what I want to do. And uh, by the way, right after I defended my thesis, I had a very long period where I didn't know exactly what I want to do. Um, I was exploring industry. I spent some time in another um, startup company doing um, Vixels, um, like lasers for communication systems. Um, and I already mentioned that I I felt that somehow I I need things to be more open and have more freedom in do in exploring things and seeing this horizon and um, so and then I came back to academia um, with with a postdoc grant so yeah. coming back to academia. Uh, was uh, was a like a natural evolution. I just realized that well, probably industry, at least at that point in my life, was not something for me. I wanted to go back to academia, um, and um, so I was um, uh, I was very um, happy to do this uh, postdoc project. But even then, I was not sure I will stay, um, and um, I I actually had a lot of doubts about staying in academia. Mm -hmm. And I remember one specific period of time when I was very close to, well, essentially quitting everything. And I am indebted to, again, my former PhD advisor. And actually, uh, my husband now, Vlad Chalai, because we started to collaborate at that point, and mm -hmm. they, they actually supported me very strongly. And um, and I remember what um, Professor Bozhevolny said. I came to him um, and I said, uh, Sergey, you know, I'm not sure that I'm doing the right thing. I just, you know, I'm just, I don't feel that I'm 
good enough for that and I don't feel that I'm going to be a professor and and I just feel that it's not something for me. I'm in doubt and he would look at me and he said, you know what? I'm still in doubt too. And <laughs> and that was like the best thing ever that advisor could say and I'm like really and he would say of course only if you're a fool you never doubt your abilities. <laughs> oh um so that was um uh, that was nice and um again i had a i had a great support from my colleagues and friends and they were uh, and uh, i stayed and i continued and yeah so with all the inspiration and help around me you really need a strong network no matter how you will build your career the most important uh, thing is people and your network um, and because you are going to leverage this network, you're going to get help, inspiration, ideas, everything is coming from a network. So my advice to you young people would be start building your network now. Wow. So you have your peers, you have your uh, classmates, um, you have your uh, group mates, uh, you have someone you interact um, with at Burke, and um, you will grow and they will grow too. So in 10, 20 years, you will be prof professor somewhere and your peer would be a, a, you know, a, a chief um, a scientist um, at one of the major companies or another professor and you would still support each other. That's one of the best advices I ever got. Build your network very early and this network supported me when I needed it and I try to do the same for my network and for all my students. That's such a nice picture like see the whole world being developing not just for now like but I, I'm just curious like you what really made you to change your mind is that your professor's work or something happened in your life? I think uh, support um, and uh, really this personal connection was the most important to me. I had, um, in, of course you have to like reinforce that, right? So this um, uh, statement from my professor was extremely important to me, but I had to go through several you know, rounds of that so that <laughs> other people would also say similar things and, and of course, uh, looking around and looking for role models was also important. Uh, for example, when I just started my postdoc, I went to um, summer school uh, for uh, women in photonics um, back in Europe, and we had um, Professor Ursula Keller, and she is absolute star um, in uh, semiconductor lasers. And uh, Professor Keller at that point uh, really um, also changed a lot of things for me. So I looked at her with your tremendous success, with your nice, with her nice family and uh, life work balance and the time few days that we spent during this workshop just us ladies talking about things um, really meant a lot to me and I looked at it and I said well this can be done and um, and 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 well everyone around me we were all doubting we were all you know girls and either students or postdocs and those female professors, they just um, they just told us, you know, uh, you can do it because there is no one else like girls. If not you, who else? Wow. You know, every time, every time you are in doubt and now I'm talking to you, all the audience, every time you are in, in doubt, just think who else? If not you, you made it thus far. Who else will do it? No one, just you. Um, so remember that. Um, so I, I can name many role models and many people that supported me uh, tremendously throughout my career. But I would say that um, this, uh, again, personal connection um, was extremely important to me. Yeah. So the challenges are still there, but because of people's support, you just get the courage back and you move forward and things is done. That's Absolutely. So 
And it's it's not only in science, right? It's everywhere. You need encouragement and you need support and you just move on. So is getting a professorship very difficult back then compared to the criteria we're having now? Uh, you mean when I started to yeah. be a professor? Um, yeah, it's the same. Um, the same thing you when you start something new, it's always very challenging. You know, I started my academic uh, job and being a professor back in Denmark. Um, supervising the first student was very hard, but again, I had great colleagues to help me with that. I um, remember writing my very first uh, very successful grant application mm -hmm. and I, I literally had one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Christensen from uh, Technical University of Denmark, he would he would just be sitting next to me and we would do it together like he wow. would tell, you know, the uh, first paragraph is the most important one for the referees and I would rewrite it and rewrite it. it I like. You would imagine that this is like a student would do that, but no, professors also learn and I had to learn how to write successful proposals, right? When wow. I started my professor job. Now, when I moved from Denmark to uh, Purdue, it was another challenge, right? And um, because it was a different country, it was a different model. No one knew me here. So I had to work my way up one more time. Luckily, one more time, I had a great safety net and I had great support and help. So, yep. uh, well, you all know that we all we work together with uh, my dear husband and uh, Vlad uh, supported me um, all the way through. And he also um, he also helped me to define uh, new directions and find new inspiration. Uh, to actually move on because at some point uh, you know you get exhausted, you feel you are stuck and probably you, you, you can't do it any longer because you don't feel that you are in the right spot. <laughs> Maybe you're taking someone else's spot who is more talented, had more <laughs> ideas um, and you need this kind of support, inspiration and ideas to move forward. So I am extremely grateful that Moving from best. Denmark to Purdue, it's really a big boom. How do you think about the challenge or the benefit back then? Um, it was uh, a lot of pluses and minuses, of course. Um, Denmark is a great country. It is a country where you get a lot of uh, our support in terms of funding, uh, being the right person in the right place and right time. And I was that person. <laughs> I was a PhD uh, from Technical University of Denmark with an independent postdoc grant, uh, which was considered to be an award. Um, I had my very successful first grant written. I got a Young Investigator Award. So, you know, things were really like lining up for me there. Um, but at the same time, um, I've been there for like nine years, right? If you count from PhD. So in academia, it's very important to move, to move on. Um, and that's why for students, we always suggest if you got your PhD, move to a different group to do your postdoc, right? You don't want to be doing the same thing. You don't want to um, be uh, around the same ideas. Um, of course, People can be very successful and always starting something new in one place, uh, but I just felt that it's time to uh, to change and 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 move on. Um, it was of course um, some um, doubts about whether I should, you know, leave and start a new position at Purdue. At the same time, uh, it. It's always exciting, right? It's something that you don't know. Like if you say that, well, I imagine uh, how my life would go because I know how, where I am now and I pretty much can predict how things will develop. But if you don't know how things will develop, um, it scares you, but 
it also interests you, right? So you are excited and you are curious to see how things will go. Um, and um, yeah, so um, there are also cultural differences. Europe and US is obviously very different. Um, there are differences in how academia works um, in Denmark and here. Um, but these are things that uh, while you learn, you also develop. It's always mm -hmm. nice to change things. That's why, for example, you have to change houses once in a while, right? <laughs> to move. <laughs> um, it's it's the same with, uh, uh, with I guess, jobs. Um, but, but right now I'm not actually planning to move from Purdue because I'm so happy here and I do feel a lot of opportunities for growth. So <laughs> it's not that I, I feel that it's time to move on. <laughs> Oh, so like you said, it's time to move on. Then you already get tenure, professorship, many, so many awards. What is your next target? Well, my next target um, would be to uh, look ahead. As I said, I am always fascinating to fascinated to see what's coming next. Um, and I think um, being at Purdue um, is. Uh, is, is really um, motivating. We have such a great collegial atmosphere, so people here work together. We have lots of brainstorming, visionary discussions. Um, what's um, important um, to know is that at Purdue so far, um, every initiative that uh, Photonics team would start and I mean myself and Vlad and uh, Alex Gildeshev, everything um, is being supported by uh, colleagues and we have uh, successful funding applications. Um, so just looking ahead and trying to define what would be next emerging thing, that's what excites me. Oh. We are witnessing uh, the ongoing revolutions right now, right? It's a quantum and AI, artificial intelligence. So right now I'm very much excited about joining the two. So how do we leverage artificial intelligence to advance engineering at large and quantum uh, devices specifically and going the other way around as well? So that's our next big thing and I'm sure that Purdue will play a great role there. So you always see the opportunity and new things happening in technology that's super fascinating. So we're running out of time for today's talk. Thank you so much professors. I think last question. So now you're also an editor in chief so you have a like a bigger view about what is happening in the academia. If you let you to give some advice for our audience how to make their research life better, what would the advice be? Uh, my advice would be uh, to keep thinking out of box and be open minded. So I feel that the most important thing right now is to be exposed to multidisciplinary most recent developments. Let's say if you are a cell biologist or you are a quantum physicist, well, learn about machine learning, right? <laughs> or you, if you are a computer scientist doing AI, uh, learn how this could transform the area of quantum communications or quantum sensors. Um, so my advice would be, first of all, stay on top of things. What is the emerging technology? What are the grand challenges that National Academy of Engineering puts forward? So be alert, see what's emerging, see what's coming up and try to get as much exposure to multidisciplinary topics as possible. Mm -hmm. Have your main focus. Well, don't spread thin focus, but mm -hmm. be open minded and being exposed to multidisciplinary environment will actually help you to think out of box and come up with new ideas. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Like, it's our pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for all the advice and like exciting stories. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Yang, and I will look forward 
to you speaking to you again at some point. Yes. And if any of you just have some questions or just want to chat, you can always shoot me an email. I'm always here and that's part of my job and I enjoy it. So please use the opportunity to connect to us professors on our completely different topics. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.